Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Horse Center this Monday. And with us, as always, is the lovely Swiss Army Sean. And we have a very special guest tonight, an absolute racing icon who is actually sixth in the entire history of North American jockeys, 10th in the entire history of the whole world for winningest jockeys with over 52,000 starts. 7,332 wins, the man, the myth, the legend, Iron Man Perry Oots. Perry, welcome to the show. Okay, glad to be here. And we can't see him. He's known for being the man in black, so he wanted to stick with that trend, but he's here, <laughs> we promise. <So. laughs> and Perry, you, your career is showing no signs whatsoever of slowing down. You're still riding at 68 years old. And I'm sure everyone tuning in tonight is well aware of all the success that you've had, everything you've done over this amazingly long career that you've had, but it bears repeating that here still in 2022, you have almost 100 wins. You are 20% win, 53% in the money. I mean, you're still just rolling and it's just phenomenal to watch you out there every day, just putting in such an amazing effort. So we're not worthy. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> here and sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Okay. And now Perry, I'm just kind of curious. I don't know if you remember me or not. The last time I saw you was probably like 20 years ago and I had a different last name then. You would know me as Jamie Bragg. I'm Harold and Pat Bragg's daughter. But, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I used to pony you all the time at Beulah yeah, Park. You and I, I both remember. got our start in racing there. So I just wanted to, you know, shout out and say hey. And I found it really funny that um, when my mom was younger, she would pony full time at the track. And then when I was younger, I ponied full time at the track. And the only jockey we had in common that we both ponied regularly was you. The entire rest of the colony had changed. But my mom and myself both got to work with you every day, which was just a pleasure. You're wonderful. I mean, I just, I was telling Sean before we started here, I had no idea like what a big deal you were at first when I first met you, cause you're just so down to earth. You'd be like, oh, you know, <laughs> what do you have for lunch? Like, oh, say hi to your mom. How so-and-so like never talked about how your horses were doing, how your career was just always on fire. Just the most low key laid back person, so. That's great. <laughs> All right. So, Perry, um, you actually come from a racing family. So do you want to tell us a little bit about some of your famous cousins and kind of how you got started in the business? Yeah. Um, early fires and uh, Jinx fires and the whole fires clan. Um, they are my cousins. And uh, we were all raised, born and raised right there in the same little town in Riverdale, Arkansas. And when I graduated from high school, um, they called me up as soon as I graduated. And seven days later, I was at Arlington Park. And they said, come on up here and we'll make a jockey out of you. So I jumped right on it and been doing it every day since. <laughs> no doubt. And um, it's pretty cool. You really came out firing. Your very second day riding, you rode nine races and you won two of them. I mean, that's practically unheard of. Uh, tell us a little bit about your early career in racing. Well, um, my first meet I ever rode at, I was leading rider there. And to tell you the truth, I probably couldn't even spell horse. I mean, <laughs> I think I started way too quick. Um, but the fires, they told me I was ready. And, um, so I went ahead and did it. And I think it took me about three years before I really felt that I was confident and competent to, to do a good job. But I went a lot of races in the first two or three years. You know, I just, I don't know if I was faking it or what, but. <laughs> Fake it till you make it, right? You got it. And I saw that um, actually one of the trainers who really kind of helped me get started on the track, the very first outfit I picked up ponying was T.R. Hahn. I saw that he also kind of helped you get started as well. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, he was working for uh, W.J. Danner, him and Doodad both. And uh, 
I kind of grew up with them guys. Like, you know, I'd, I'd known them ever since the first day I came to Beulah Park. Um, and like I said, Doodad and TR both, uh, I think Doodad was galloping and TR was grooming at the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so you definitely have had plenty of success at Beulah Park, but you are the undisputed king of River Downs, now known as Belterra Park. Um, right. You've had, what, 35 leading rider titles there? Is that right? That's true, 35. Wow. So you have gotten plenty of attention throughout your career for um, – the way that you ride, you're known as a high quality, high percentage rider. You certainly could have taken the opportunity to go to some of the bigger tracks to, you know, try and seek out, you know, those Kentucky Derby mounts, those Breeders' Cup mounts. But you have made your home right in Ohio. And uh, what is it about River Downs and whatnot that made you want to stay there instead of trying to go to those bigger name tracks? Well, I always did really, really well. Uh, at River Downs, and I like winning more than I like making the big money. I mean, the winning is what gives me the thrill to do this every single day. Sure. I mean, I get that same thrill if it's four thousand dollar claimer, if it's fifty thousand dollar stake. I get that same thrill every single time, and I think that's why I've stayed around here so long because I've been down to Keeneland, Churchill, and I went a few races, but it ain't, they don't come in bundles like what I like. And uh, I think that's why I've stuck it around here for so long. Like I said, I, th I think I could have made it at the bigger tracks if I'd have went and applied myself, but I just seemed like I couldn't win as m often as I really like. So I just stuck it out around here and oh, it's paid off. Okay. I mean, I I've right. <laughs> haven't got rich doing it, but I I've made a decent living. Oh, yeah, you have definitely, you're one in a million. Your career is just absolutely phenomenal. I had so much fun researching this episode. Of course, I know who you are, but just getting into all of the details, it was like, wow, like it, it's just mind blowing. So definitely, you know, you picked the right path. We loved having you in Ohio. I loved growing up, you know, watching you ride and, you know, kind of getting to feel like I was a little piece of it. So oh, thank you. Thank you for staying in my backyard. But uh, <laughs> So um, you're also known for being incredibly tough. You have broken over 40 bones, including 11 vertebrae. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about, I heard a little story where riding your motorcycle home from work one morning, uh, you got into an incident. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I just got done galloping. And I was on my way home to take a shower and then come back for the day's racing. And I was going down 275. Um, I was in the middle lane. There's three lanes there. I was doing about 70 miles an hour, and a car came over from the right lane and just ran right into me and knocked me off my bike. Bike went rolling down the road there. I came rolling behind it. I finally got off the road, and there was a guy um, – right behind me and he seen the whole thing happen and he had sense enough to slow down and stay right behind me and kept all the cars off of me and, until I finally rolled off the side of the road. And I finally quit rolling and I stood up and I wiggled everything, my uh, legs, my hands, and didn't break anything. I said, that was a miracle right there. I mean, a miracle. Man. I mean, I didn't have a scratch on me. So, wow. I mean, I think God had his hands all over that wreck that day. And uh, I called my agent and I said, I just had a wreck and a wrecker came, picked my bike up. He came, picked me up, took me home. I came back to the races and win the first two races that day. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> it was I, a wild day. I've got a lot of mileage out of that story. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. I mean. I don't know who else totals their motorcycle and comes right back an hour later and wins a couple races, but obviously you do. <laughs> now, I also saw that at age 50, when most riders have already, they're well into their retirement at age 50, at least from riding races. Um, right. But you had a pretty serious accident. Um, you broke your arm. You also injured vertebrae. I mean, 
that's very serious, nothing to, you know, scoff at. And you still came back even at age 50, you just racing was still in your heart. I mean, how do you do it? How on earth do you know how dangerous this game is? And you're <laughs> at the age where most people are already done with it. And you're like, no, let's keep going. <laughs> I guess it's just a uh, pure determination just because I, I just, I like it that much that I just like to keep, keep going. But I know you can't do it forever. I mean, like I said, at 68, I'm very past the twilight days. I mean, but like I said, I'm going to try at least another year, like next summer. Because I'm only like, I think 60. 62? 62 wins away from David Gull. And that yep. would place uh, me fifth on the uh, standings. Wow. And uh, I, I would like to do that before I quit. I, I couldn't go any higher because... Uh, Pat Day, he's the next guy, and he's got over eight thousand. So there's no shot of that. But but I think getting past David Gull is doable if I could have another decent summer like I did this year. Oh and yeah, I, you're on fire right now. Definitely yeah. within your reach. <laughs> yeah, I rode eight races today and won three. So oh, uh, congratulations! Yeah, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Carrie, what is it about the competitiveness with you? You said before in another interview about eight years ago, I believe that you can't explain what it's like to win on a horse and how it's different than anything else. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, like I said, I've never found anything in life that gives you that same thrill or that same high feeling. Um, I, I don't know what it is. It's just that every time you cross that finish line first, it's just, unbelievable the feeling you get and uh like i said i've been very fortunate to get that feeling over seven thousand times so i've been truly blessed truly you also blessed. said you also said you don't remember your first one but you do kind of remember it just going in slow motion yeah it it did when i crossed the finish line that's what the whole thing felt like i was in slow motion and i'm kind of looking around and i said i can't believe i just win that <laughs> And uh, then I come back a couple of races later and win another one. And then, like I said, I was winning a lot of races that first meet. And I'm thinking, well, man, I could be the next Willis Shoemaker. I said, this racket's easy. <laughs> but then I, I, I found out later on that it wasn't that easy. I just got really, really lucky right off the bat. And uh, like I said, I look back at it now and I, I don't think I knew what I was doing at all. But. Like I said, I had W.J. Danner back them days, and he wins so many races that pretty much all you had to do was hang on to them, and they, they just carried you around there. So, but like I said, about, th ride. <laughs> yeah, about three years after that, I, I kind of felt that I was capable of getting a horse around there pretty good. So, what do you think you learned three years later that you didn't know when you first started? I don't know maybe timing a little bit um so you <clears throat> so that's what you're looking for you're looking for a number five and then you're then you might be uh you're not looking to be the oldest to ever win a race no <laughs> <laughs> no not really like you don't I said, have too far to go for that if i couldn't be competitive i wouldn't even want to do it i don't want to ride just to say i'm a jockey i just I like to win. I mean, I've been very competitive my whole life since, like I said, that first meet that I rode at Beulah Park, and I was leading rider then, and I thought, man, this is great. So I've always strived to, to do my best every day. So from the outside noise, because you hear all the time about jockeys don't care, yada, yada, yada. What do you think of that, that people don't realize how competitive jockeys actually are? Yeah, most of them that, that – like to win they are very competitive i mean very it's like uh russell bays he had the same kind of mentality that i did he just rode because he loved to win yeah and he had the big fish in the little pond like you said and right not the and he, he tried santa anita and he did okay uh, he won races but he didn't like it he didn't enjoy it because he wasn't winning tons of races every day and that's what he liked to do he liked to win and he's very competitive and i always said that he was probably the only guy i know that liked to ride more than i did 
<laughs> but he but he retired about seven years ago, so I was wrong about that. He he didn't like it as much as I did. Still do you have any contact? Time. Do you have any contact with him anymore? Because he kind of uh, just went off in the sunset. No, not really. I just I, I would talk to him a little bit when he came in to ride stakes or something here at Turfway and stuff, and that's about it. But he's a super super nice guy. But I tell what do you, you think I tell uh, you a guy who I um really have kept in contact with about 30 or 40 years mike smith one of the nicest guys in the world we and love every mike. time he <laughs> every time he sees you he just acts like he's just so glad to see you every single time <laughs> i mean and i know him before he was mike smith he was riding here at turfway park right back when he first started and uh, that's where i first met him at was he was like 21 years old and uh that was before he was big money mike <laughs> but he, he hasn't changed at all though I, I just seen him not too long ago i was out in california um went out for a wedding for my uh wife's sister's daughter got married and the hotel we were staying at was like seven miles from los alamitas and i told tony i said um if we hurry up, we can catch the last two races down there and we can see Mike Smith. He rides the last. So we did. We went down there and, and seen him. And that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah we've he, had Mike on, Mike on the show a couple times. And I actually met him at Parks while I was covering uh, the PA Derby for uh, TVG. Really nice guy. Uh, super, super nice. Always got a he, smile on his face. Just treats really, everybody the same, too. Everybody. I mean, he is just yeah. so, so nice and so pleasant. And like I said, and he was like that back when he first started, when he was like 21 years old. That's when I met him. That was like, I don't know, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, something like that. But like I said, he rode here at Turfway Park. That's where I met him at. And like I said, he went on to bigger and better things. I, I talk about this all the time, and this is part of what this show is about and stuff. But don't you think horse racing should market you guys a lot better as athletes like other sports do? Because I just put the question, I just put the question out there on Twitter, and it exploded. Do you watch horse racing without betting? And a lot of people have said yes, and I don't feel like that's taken advantage of at all in the market. That's true. Yeah, I agree with you totally. I mean, anyone who comes to the track, like jockeys, are there. There are superstars. There are, you know, there. <laughs> They're everything. And um, we all have our favorites and our least favorites, the ones you want to root for and against. Like, it's a huge missed opportunity, definitely. Right. So, Perry, what do you think out of all your, I, I believe it's 7,335 wins now with your three today. Yeah. What would you consider your biggest win? That would be the cradle stakes here at River Downs. It was 200,000. And that, that was pretty cool. What about your uh, favorite horse of all time, or is it the horse that you won that race with? No. My favorite okay. horse of all time was a horse called High Carol. And she started running when I had the bug, when I first started riding. And through her career, she run about five years. I win 25 races on her, and 16 of them were handicaps. So wow. she will always be my all-time favorite. She was just such a runner. And her whole career, she went through, she went 25. I went every one of them, went every, every wow. race she ever won. So wow. she was definitely my favorite. How special is that when a jockey and a horse just get that kind of relationship where you guys win a lot and you just have one heck of a relationship? I think the horse knows. They can feel it. And I think that's why they run so well for you because a couple of times I got hurt and some other people wrote her, but they never went on her. So I was always real happy about that. <laughs> that nobody else <laughs> went on her. <laughs> yeah. And here, here's another story with that same horse. I had went down in a spill and I broke my collarbone and Danner, he was the trainer of this horse. And he said, Hey, I need you to ride this horse for me. I said, WJ, I've got a broken collarbone. I can't ride. He said, you ain't going to have to ride. All you're going to have to do is hang on. He said, the pony boy will get you to the gate. He said, the gate man will handle you in the gate. He said, and they'll pull you up after the race is over. He said, just don't fall off when the gate's open. 
I said, okay. Well, the race went just like that. Horse broke out of there, went right to the front, galloped around, set a track record. And I did nothing but sit on her. I mean, wow. I grabbed a handful of mane and galloped her around there. That's all I did. I had one of them figure eight harnesses to hold your shoulder back. And I couldn't do no riding. And I told him. And years later, I asked him, why did you put me on that horse? He said, well, you're the only one that's ever went on her. He said, I didn't want to break the streak. So I did. <laughs> You can pretty much ask anybody about that story, and it's, it's a true story. But she was so nice, though. She, she had a lot of speed, and it was on the turf, and that was one of her specialties. She'd run on anything, but turf, you could hardly never beat her. And like I said, I just held a handful of mane and held on to her and galloped her around. So that was a pretty good story. <laughs> no doubt. Now, Perry, you said that when you first started riding, you couldn't spell horse. We've got a comment here from Belladonna saying that they couldn't read the form, but they would always bet on you anyway. So I guess the blind leading the blind here, but it worked out for <laughs> both of you, right? <laughs> yes, very, very much so. And we got another comment here from Willie Martinez. Uh, I miss the days at Turfway Park and Perry was always a class act gentleman, awesome jock. This is true. You are also known for just being a very solid guy. Like I said, you never put on airs. I had no oh, idea how special you were when I first met you. I'm like, oh, yeah, Perry, he's nice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that reminds me, speaking of Turfway Park, I'm always curious, how do you handle that winter racing at Turfway, at Beulah? Like when I was ponying there, we got to wear, you know, 35 layers and just take you guys straight to the gate and come right back. How on earth do you handle being out there in those tiny little silks? <laughs> well, you don't enjoy it, trust me. <laughs> but you just do. You just do it because it's your job, I guess. Yeah. Like I said, who, who thought night racing in the wintertime was a good idea? That's what I'd like to know. I know. <laughs> okay. You know, because at least in the wintertime, if you got the sun shining, it don't feel quite as bad. But as soon as that sun goes down, it gets really, really cold. And oh. they've, ra they've raced at night here for uh, 49 years that I've been riding. So they didn't really care about my opinion on that subject. Yeah, every time I went to Turfway, I regretted it. I can say <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you've done it all this time. But I had another um, kind of a selfish question for you. But um, everyone knows your lovely wife, Tony, and uh, she has horses. And I she hear, does. I hear that every day after you get done getting on your morning horses and before you go and ride in the afternoon, you will go by her barn and help clean stalls, walk hots, do whatever needs to be done. I mean, how can I get this with Willie and I? How, how, do you, how did you work this out? Give me some tips here. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I, uh, I get on horses for her first thing in the morning every day. And then I go out to, uh, after that, and go out and get on everybody else's horses. So I uh, I work hard for her. But she works hard. I've never seen anybody work as hard as she does. I mean, seven days a week, that would drive me insane. <laughs> but she's been doing it for 15 years, I guess, nonstop, every single day. But she loves her horses. I've never seen anybody that loves horses as much as she does. And a well, couple of years ago, she finally bought even her. Match. Yeah, a couple of years ago, she finally went in partners with the lady she's working for, and they bought one and went a couple with him, and they claimed him, and they claimed a couple more, and they went with them, and so she's been doing pretty good with her horses. Yes. How hard was it? How, how hard was it for you, Perry, to learn this whole hissa thing in the whip roll? Oh man, that was tough. That was real tough because that was one of my things. I could really, really get after a horse real, real good. I mean, I didn't hit a horse hard, but I would hit them very often. And uh, it was so hard when they when they cut it back. I mean, it was just – I still haven't got real used to it, but they haven't fined me quite as much this time as they did last year. <laughs> last year, they, they got me pretty good last year. When I first started with the rules for not hitting them so much, no. Mm -hmm. This year they've only got me once so far, so that's not too bad, I guess. 
That's really uh, good. Yeah. I, I don't really like it. It's it's not helping the horses with them little round um, hot dog looking sticks that they got nowadays. You couldn't <laughs> you couldn't hurt them if you tried. We yeah. hear that from everyone. Yeah, you see, that's and, that's just public perception, and yeah, you know. Exactly. You've talked about how much you love the horses, how much your wife loves the horses. And Rich, the other host, always says, we wish we could bring somebody that all these people against horse racing on our show and just have a friendly debate and prove to them that what their image is is not correct. Right. right. I just want to smack them around with the whip a few times so they can <laughs> see that it's not that bad. <laughs> Let alone if you've got thick horse skin. I mean, these whips, they're just completely different from what you would see a few decades ago. There's right, no comparison. Right. How hard is it though when like you're coming down the stretch and like you can't you can't do that to I mean as a better I would want you to be able to do that as well. Well yeah, like I said, that's cheating the public in my opinion. Yeah. It is. It's cheating them bad. Cause a lot of times they don't know. They don't know that you can't hit them but six times. So but. it's a really low number too. Like I'm on board with, okay, you know, we don't want to see someone hitting a horse 30 times. I get that, but right. my goodness, six, like, can we at least do like 10? You know? Yeah. And like I said, I think it would be good if, if they would let you hit them and then hand ride them a little bit and then right. hit them, hand ride sure. them a little bit, you know, don't just keep pounding away on them, but you ought to be able to hit them as many times as you want if you right. don't just keep hitting them. If you just hit them once, let them run a little bit, hit them once, let them run a little bit. Well, that wouldn't be too bad, but yeah. six rules. Sometimes I lose count a, right. a lot, you know, because especially if it's close, you're coming down to the race and it's, you're head and head and you, you just lose count how many times you hit them. Sure. Uh, uh, they do what they want though. It was people yeah. who made up these rules that didn't know nothing about horse racing. Yeah. The hiss of people. They know nothing about horse racing. Yeah. Uh, but you got to do what they say, you know, their house, their rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot's changed. Uh, Perry, I saw this really great quote that you had. It was actually in uh, this amazing documentary, which I highly recommend anyone who hasn't watched it. Um, Iron Man Perry Oots. So good. I actually saw it on YouTube, but I think you can watch it on a few different platforms. Super fun. Uh, well, first of all, what was it like making that documentary? Uh, they just followed me around with a camera for three days. I didn't really do nothing. <laughs> okay. Went to work every day. That's about all I did. Sure. They, sure. they did. They followed me around for about three days. And uh, like I said, I didn't really prepare for it or do anything. I just went to work and did my thing and they just followed me around. Well, that's great. They got you in your natural habitat. Yeah. But, but I believe the quote I saw was from that documentary um, talking about you being in the Hall of Fame, which I personally have a big bone about this. I mean, I grew up at Beulah Park. I've only pretty much stayed at smaller tracks. And um, I just don't feel like the horsemen at those tracks get enough credit, whether it's the trainers, the riders. I mean, they're some of the best horsemen out there because, as you said in there, you're working with Volkswagens instead of Cadillacs and you're exactly. still getting the same performance with, you know, a product that, you know, would be considered inferior. I mean, doesn't that speak even more to your drive and your ability than it does to someone who's coming out there in a fancy race car and getting the <laughs> same job done, you know, like. You would yeah. sure think so. But like I said, if the hall <laughs> yeah. of fame people, they just didn't, didn't really think that, um, you know, just because you win all them races, it didn't matter because you were at a smaller racetrack. But like I said, it was actually harder to win those that many races at smaller tracks on less oh, inferior horses or you know less quality or, or I don't I don't want to insult the, the smaller horses, but um, most of the horses that I went on the seven thousand races, they didn't pull me around there. Right, I mean, hardly <laughs> any of them. I mean, I had to ride every single one of them. Right. A, lo a lot of them, you had to hold them up while you were riding them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, you don't see a lot of flight lines at Beulah Park and River Downs, but yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's only been one horse that ever come out of River Downs that was really, really good, and that was uh, Spin the Buck. Yeah. Uh, he, he did run here at River Downs, so. Okay. But that was pretty cool. 
Sure. I was in that I was in that race that day with him. Wow. And, and it was the cradle stakes. It was the same race that I win. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we're big proponents here. We love the little guys, as you would call them. I mean, they're some of the hardest working, most knowledgeable. And the thing is, too, the money is not at these tracks like it is at the big tracks. These people are doing it for love of the game, for love of right. the animals. I mean, they're not getting rich off of this. They're mm, just yeah. doing what they love. And they deserve a lot more credit than they get, in my opinion. It might be biased, but. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Totally. It's like the, the Hall of Fame people have actually said before that I've got all the the credentials to get in the Hall of Fame. I just didn't win any of the big races, and that's the only thing that's kept me out. They had a thing one time um, where they were trying to get me into the Hall of Fame. Somebody had started a, a, a thing around here, a grassroots uh, push to get me in, and I was on the ballot. Um there was 10 in it that year and I was number eight on the ballot. So I got close. I got honorable mention. Well, there you go. Well, now, now that you're on that, this show, we should start another one. There you That's go. right. <laughs> we'll start a petition today. Sean, put it in the yeah. social media. <laughs> but like Absolutely. I said, if I never got in there, it wouldn't, it wouldn't change my life one bit. You know, I wouldn't, that's just something I don't really care about whatsoever. But I did get to go up there one time when my cousin got inducted to the Hall of Fame, early fires. Yeah. And now that was pretty cool that time. That that was really, really something special. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it may not change anything for you, but I feel like it would change things for the sport. And, you know, with Hissa and whatnot, that's what we're trying to convince everyone. Like, hey, guys, we're in this for love of these animals, not because we want to abuse them and make a fortune off of them. We're here right. because we love them and they love to run and it's a great thing for everyone. You know, why not showcase that with people who have, you know, the 10th most leading rider of all time. How does he not belong in the hall of fame? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like we got another was, comment here too yeah. from Sean Patrick Nolan. I'm, I'm signing Perry belongs in the hall. Yes. Uh, yeah. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question on social media earlier too, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer. You're competitive, but they said, who is the better jockey out of early fires? Um, John Court and yourself. Well, who you think's winning the most? <laughs> <laughs> I, like I said, I knew the answer. So, but uh, I figured I'd just put well, it Well, let's first. put it to you like this. <laughs> they used to have a sign at Rivervale. It said Rivervale home of early fires one of the winningest jockeys in the country. They had to take it down because I went past him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Riverdale, yeah, so that sounds about, like a small I'm about place. a thousand, a thousand uh, winners in front of him now. That wow. Yeah, close to a thousand. Yeah. That's impressive considering a lot of jockeys never make it anywhere near a thousand. So. Right. <laughs> right. But like I said, I've been blessed. Um, that I haven't had any weight problem in the 49 years that I've been riding. I've weighed 110 pounds for almost 49 years every single day, maybe up a pound, down a pound, but almost 110 pounds every single day. But I'm very dedicated. I know exactly what to eat every day, how much not to eat. If I'm a little heavy, you eat a little less. If you're a little light, you eat a little more. And I've done that for 49 years, so it's been really, really uh, lucky for me that I don't have to fight it. And I think that's what's kept me going for so long is because a lot of guys, when they fight it after about 20 years, they just get – their body gives up on them. And uh, sure. like I said, and I've been lucky that um, I've been very disciplined from day one. And uh, I think that's what's kept me going for so long. Has, has your diet stayed the same in those 49 years? And what is your diet? Pretty much what I do is I have coffee and roll for breakfast. I have like a half a sandwich for lunch, and then I eat a regular uh, meal for supper. Just, you know, like normal people would eat. And I eat little snacks here throughout the day, but I never, ever sit around and pig out, ever. And uh, even when I get hurt, I never gain any weight because I always eat the same. So, like I said, that's really, really helped that, you know, my weight don't yo-yo up and down. So, like oh. I said, I've weighed the same almost for 49 years within a pound or two. 
every day. I was going to ask you for advice, but I just don't have your dedication to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just admire from afar. <laughs> um, does that how how much does that change when you're doing the night racing instead of day racing? Uh, it's horrible because you don't get to eat your nice supper. You know, then I come home in the middle of the night and eat a bowl of cereal, and that was your supper. So I, I don't really care for night racing. Like I said, I've done it for so many years because I have to, but I don't enjoy it. Not at all. And that's also, you got to wake up early in the morning, do the workouts, and you get some Still. free time, and then you got to <laughs> yes. go. Yes. But now with the day racing, you kind of get to get it all over with at one time, right? Right, right. Yeah, go work um, in the morning, get into a motorcycle crash, come back and ride the afternoon, and then you're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the other home. question I was going to ask. Then you go home, <laughs> you go to bed, get up, start all over again. Wash, yep. rinse, repeat. Wash, rinse, repeat. Do you still ride motorcycles? I do. <laughs> there you go. Yep, yep. I've been riding since I was 16 years old and had a motorcycle almost that whole time. Do you have any hobbies that aren't life threatening? No. That's, <laughs> really, that's that's the only hobby I have is riding motorcycles <laughs> and riding horses. That's it. I don't hunt. I don't fish. I don't play golf. I don't watch sports on TV. I don't do anything. I ride horses and I ride my bike once in a while, and that's about it. So it's kind of a boring uh, life, but I enjoy it. It's not well, boring you if have... you're enjoying it. Yeah, you've got all those wins to keep you distracted. Yep. <laughs> what uh, when you do retire, and I'm sure this is probably the hard part. What are you going to try to replace the competitiveness with? Well, I'm really hoping my wife will take out her trainer's license and get about four horses of her own. And then I would just gallop them in the mornings and uh, work them and stuff, and she would groom them and train them, and that's about it. Just because I, I got to stay busy. The doctors done told me if you quit riding, they said you've got to stay busy or else your body will crumble. I mean, it will get ugly real quick sitting on the couch. And I can sit on the couch for four or five hours, and I'm telling you, you get really stiff. <laughs> so I just stay moving. That's what I do. I got up at five o'clock this morning, and as soon as we get done here, I'm fixing to go to bed and start all over again tomorrow. You're tough. Then <laughs> <laughs> the two other things I had is Jerry Dixon said hi. Okay. Um, Good guy. He, he ran that uh, horse, old man Buck, the day I went on him at the Cradle Stakes. Yeah, he was there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing for the bobblehead giveaway, I, uh, can you give me a number between 1 and 20, and then I'll announce the winner on that one. Uh, seven. Seven, Okay. All right, you can go, Jamie, and I'll find out who was number seven. Oh, okay. I can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you have anything. Um... Oh, okay, okay. I was like, wait, you want me to leave? <laughs> like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I was so Yeah, the first time I'm kicking there. you out. <laughs> awesome. So um, uh, another thing that I had noticed, Perry, like I said earlier, I was um, kind of, doing a little research before here just to make sure that I was brushed up on everything you've got going on. And I noticed that on your social media, you're not very active. You're not on there much, but you did hop on pretty much to shout out other people. Like you're not out there promoting yourself or your big wins <laughs> or the articles being written about you. But I saw that you had posted something about Mario Pino winning. And I just thought that was so impressive, you know, that here you are shouting out other people who didn't quite get to your level of success, but close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. He he did very well, Mario did. He was yes. a, another guy that was super, super nice guy. I mean, just right. so yes. down to earth. It's just unbelievable. Yes, absolutely. And can you tell us a little bit about a nickname I heard that you've earned, Scoot and Boot? <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. No idea. <laughs> I think it's because I used to send them out of the gate really, really hard, and that just kind of stuck. I don't even know who gave it to me. Yeah. 
I know. I was curious about that as well. I'm like, okay, interesting. But yeah, that's what I heard also. Jeff Englehart, he has so many wonderful things to say about you. He's followed your career forever. And right, uh, right. I heard it from him and, you know, he's kind of the guru on Periut. So yeah. <laughs> hey, you were talking about that, um, that documentary. Yes. Um, those guys who shot that documentary, uh, they won an Eclipse Award for that. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. That's amazing. I thought that was pretty good. And yes. uh, they called me up and they said, asked me would I come down when they uh, accepted the trophy. I said, no, I got to work at Turfway that night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I wound up winning a race that night, the night they give that trophy out. So. Oh, no, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. Great documentary, too. I can't recommend it enough. I enjoyed it so much. Them guys did a really, really good job with that. They did. I mean, they made everybody at uh, Belterra look really good. I mean, they, they <laughs> yeah. made them all look good. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I think the sport needs more of and to be shared. Right. Um, right. We're trying to work on some stuff like that. But, uh, you know, money and time uh, kind of prevent some of that. <laughs> And when right, I, I went out to uh, California, it's been about eight years ago, and uh, I, I was going out there to visit my wife's family, and uh, they asked me, what do you want to do when you get out there? I said, well, I want to go to Santa Anita. And they said, okay, we can do that. And then I got to thinking about it. I said, told Tony, I said, I'm going to try to get me a mount out there while, I'm, while we're out there on vacation. So I told my agent, and he called up this guy, uh, Tom Proctor. Oh. And Tom says, sure, I'll give him a mount. He put me on a horse in a 100,000 added race that day. <laughs> uh, can you believe that? I just wanted a mount. That's all I wanted. A good give me a mount, mount. And a state. <laughs> Yeah. The horse didn't run any good, but it was such an experience. And uh, they had me on uh, HRTV, I think, when they had that back in the day. Okay. I can't remember what it was called. HRTV, I think. I HRTV, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they're interviewing me and they said, well, how much longer are you going to ride? And I said, well, if I can ride six more years, I can draw Social Security off this job. <laughs> well, sure enough, when I turned 66, I started drawing Social Security some <laughs> and still doing it. So uh, I just thought that was funny. Uh, no one can beat your dedication, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, Sean, do we have our winner? Yeah, Joe Galliano um, at, at that man 27 on Twitter is the All winner right. of the Perry Oud signed bobblehead, which we appreciate Perry for giving us. Yes, thank um, you so much, Perry. No problem. I will, uh, I will message him if he didn't hear that, or you can message us on social. Do on you have Twitter. the bobblehead? Can we see a little? Yeah. Oh, let's see it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> See, you just got to put that over on the little screen where Perry's face should be. And then <laughs> there you go. There, yeah, we should have done that. <laughs> uh, like I said, I have no idea what happened to the camera on this thing. We probably should have set it up just a little bit before the, the show started. But hey, let me tell you, the last week that I was on here, the hurricane was striking and like oh, my audio was going out. Things were, it was wild, but we always get through it somehow, knock on wood. So <laughs> no worries. We roll with the punches here. Yeah. I have to tell I have to tell Perry too. You were so every time I would put out who somebody wanted on, they would keep saying Perry Oots. If you check yeah. your Facebook, you you do have a message from me, but I know you're not very active on social media. So I was like, I can't find him. Can't get a hold of him, and Deshaun Parker, I believe, is the one that uh, hooked us up. So I appreciate yeah. that from Deshaun as well. Yeah. And there's uh, another guy, that's Perry. super, super nice guy. I mean, he's yes. another one of the kind of guys that every time he sees you, he just acts like you're his, his best friend. You know, he's just so glad to yes. see you. And uh, we I gotta like have Deshaun back on. I wasn't on that week, and I was so sad. So <laughs> we gotta get him back. <laughs> We'll get them back. We'll get them back. You know, so you say that, Perry, and I, I agree. Like, I talk to a lot of jockeys, and you guys are one of the nicest people. What is it about the profession? Is it because you guys are doing something you love that keep you keeps everybody pretty happy? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think also, like, because, you know, we're usually inviting on pretty successful riders. I think that having that kind of friendly personality is a big part of the success in the game. Like, 
you know, you want to have nice people coming by your barn. You want to chat about the horse. You don't want someone who's always like, right. Somebody's <laughs> like, st stuck on itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It helps. It helps your business. Yes. Yes. How Have you ever had, and you don't have to mention names, obviously, but have you ever had that like arch rival that kind of you always ran into that you weren't very friendly with? <laughs> No, not that's a really. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I have met a few famous jockeys uh, that had came in to ride stakes and stuff, and I wasn't very impressed with. I won't yeah. mention no names or nothing, but yeah. there, there was a couple. But and then you meet some of the most successful ones, and they're the nicest guys, like John Velasquez, nicest guy in the yes. world. Yeah. And Ramon Dominguez, same way. Just the nicest guy you ever meet in your life. Yeah. And uh, Gary Stevens, same way. Just super, super, super nice. And, For sure. Uh, and like I said, and then I met a couple that were thought they were the God's gift to the racehorse. So, <laughs> yeah. But like I said, it, there wasn't too many, just a few, you know, that were like that. But most of them were pretty good guys. Chris McCarron, he's another guy. He's super, super nice guy. Yeah, and, and you're Day. definitely Pat oh, Day, yeah. same way, just super, super nice. Just yeah. every time you see them, they're yeah. like that, you know, just glad to see you. Like when I won my 7,000th race, uh, Pat Day had drove up from Louisville to be here for it. Oh, so wow, I thought that was really, really good. You know, I thought that was just so nice of him taking the time out of his day. And he said, man, I hope you win it today. I don't know if I can come back tomorrow. <laughs> I, I did. I got lucky and win it that day when he was here. So that was pretty cool. Very cool. You have any, you have any young jockeys that you either ride with or that you've seen around the country that you think are going to be a star someday? Uh, I'm trying to think. Not really. I haven't really been paying that that close of attention. Yeah. But we know you've mentored so many people. We had John McKee on the other day who could not say enough good things about you. And Willie absolutely adores you. I mean, he's a pretty good judge of character. And I said, oh, Perry's coming on the show. He was like, oh, he's the best. I'm like, I yeah. know. <laughs> I've known Willie for quite a few years. Yeah. 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 Back in the turfway days. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You got anything else, Sean? No, that's all I got. We'll definitely... Uh... We're going to get you on again, Perry, before you retire, for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got plenty of time, I know. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, I've been racing on ball time for almost 20 years, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on. And like I said, I just feel like I should be saying we're not worthy the whole time. <laughs> like, you, you're one in a million, Perry. We just well, thank you. Love having you on here. So you have a wonderful night and keep the continued success. We will for sure keep watching. All right. Thank you. Have Thanks, a good Bert. night. All right. Oh, okay. I got this comment just popped up. That seems pretty interesting. Ask me anything about pig racing. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rock and Ray, please do tell. <laughs> Private message or something. This sounds like a story I'd have to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Perry is absolutely amazing. So glad that you got him on, Sean. He's he's the best. I ha really have not seen him in like 20 years, so I had no idea if he would remember me or not. He's probably seen like thousands of pony girls, but that just goes to show you what a nice guy he is. I mean... He's another one that all of us would fight over. Like, I want Perry. No, I want Perry. <laughs> I got stuck with this guy. That's terrible. Give me Perry next time, you know? So. <laughs> well, I appreciate the Sean Parker uh, passing on the information and hooking us up. Because like you said, he's not very active on social media. So it was very hard to get a right. touch with him. So, Yeah, he just gets Perfect. on to shout out other people. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> that's great. You know, like, hey, wow, what a nice person. All right. So as far as racing news goes, we've got um, we've got the good, the bad and the ugly. All right. So let's start off with the bad and get this out of the way. Um, so Mountaineer Park. Uh, so apparently they've got a chronic vet shortage, which I did not realize how bad it had gotten. I used to be at Mountaineer, but that was many, many moons ago. Um, Hiss is going to be going there to kind of take a look into this and maybe see if there's anything they can do, I assume. 
But it seems that half the time when these horses are training in the morning, there's no vet, which to me is absolutely terrifying. Uh, and apparently it's been an issue before where a horse needed help and it took a vet half an hour to get there because there was no one at the track, which normally, yeah. you know, we like having the ambulance and the vet right there. If someone needs help, boom. I mean, it's scary, honestly. Yeah, it doesn't make sense because it's true that you need an ambulance to want to run a race, right? Yes. You have to have an ambulance there, right? So it's well, the I same think as the like- Well, I vet is there at the races, but I think it's a problem where there's not a vet on the grounds all the time, which most tracks have a vet there all the time. Right, or and two, that's what I'm saying. So, or three. Like if it, <laughs> Like if an ambulance left the horse track, you're not running another race till that ambulance comes sure. back or until there's another ambulance. So I feel like right. it should be the same way with a vet. Like you can't, you can't run races and take the chance that something happens like it did. And a horse yeah. goes a half hour without any that's, help at all. That's just, that honestly, that's not, it just hurts my heart. That's not good. That. And that's, that's the part of the sport that needs to be. Yes. Fixed. And you know, that's what gives yes. people the ammo that they get. Right. Um, these yeah. stories aren't as common as people want to make them out to be. But, no, they're incredibly but, rare. I mean, that's why it's big news because it's like, what on earth? Like, I, this is hard to believe that this actually happens. But um, yeah, I mean, and honestly, I hate to say this and to kind of throw Mount Mirror under the bus, but they're one of the ones that we seem to see like on these odd stories more often than not. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah I, th I think they're definitely you know they're having all kinds of issues um obviously with shortages of things money and all kinds of things unfortunately right yeah and it's a hard area i mean i lived there for a couple of years there's not anything around there most people don't want to go and stay there so i'm sure it's hard to attract vets to come and stay at mount mirror it's not you know some big fun exciting place to live like you know you know let's say Presque downs not the most expensive track, not like the highest quality track, but Erie, Pennsylvania is a really nice place. You know, there's a ton of fun things to do. There's a little beach there. There's tons of nice restaurants. I mean, when you're a mountaineer, there's nothing. There's literally the racetrack and that's it. That one restaurant, that's all you got. You, there's a McDonald's. That's it. You know, so <laughs> it's a rough area to try and attract people to. But I mean, this hopefully... Hissa will be able to actually do something here, do something useful. That's what they're here for is to fix situations like this. So let's see yep. what happens, right? Yep. Now let's get over the ugly and let's get to the good. Um, I was super excited to see this. Um, friend of the show here, Kylie Jordan. Um, has she been on the show once or twice? Once. We're trying to book once. her a second time. Um, okay. Be, yeah. Probably very busy right now because she's headed <laughs> yeah. to the Breeders' Cup. Uh, how, yeah. how fabulous. She literally just lost her bug. I mean, she's had just an unbelievable bug year. This girl on fire does not begin to describe what she's had going on. She can't lose. And I'm so happy for her. She's fabulous. She looks awesome on a horse. She's got super great head on her shoulders from what I can see. I've never met her in person, but I love the interview you guys have done with her. I follow her. Um, she just seems fabulous. And now she's headed to the Breeders' Cup. She's headed to the big time. You know, she's been riding at kind of smaller tracks. So to get her chance in the big stage and the spotlight, I am so excited for her. I can't wait to see what happens. Great. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. She's 20 years old and getting to experience all this. I think she went into Kentucky last week. She did ride a couple this weekend at Keeneland. Mm -hmm. um, I know one for it. So she'll be riding here or there where she gets a mount or two, and then she'll just sure. be training with Tyler's tribe, who I believe she's been on every, and you know, it's one of those situations we just talked about with Perry where um, Kylie's riding Tyler's tribe every time out and Tyler's tribe is five for five and next shots at the Breeders' there Cup. And not only is Kyler, Kylie Jordan kind of the underdog going in against big dogs, but so is Tyler's tribe. So right. it'll be that underdog story if we can, and if yes. Tyler's tribe wins, so it'd be I'm really be looking great. forward to that coverage. I love the little pre-shows where they go into the deep background. I'm really hoping that this is one they want to highlight because it's a good story. Yeah, and like you said with the interview, I, when Rich and I finally got to meet her and talk to her, we were blown away with, and we both left again that she's going to be very, very, very successful. 
And that was yeah. before before she went on this tear that she's going on in the last right. little bit here. I think we had her back on, I don't know, it was uh, February, March, somewhere in there. Um, yeah. So she's been on a tear since. Yes. So absolutely yeah. on fire. I feel like you guys manifest things on this show and they just <laughs> happen. So <laughs> there we let's go. manifest yeah. some more wins for Willie Martinez. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. So you got anything else, Sean? What's going on the rest of the week? So tomorrow we have apprentice jockey, John Harago on. Yes. Um, and then Wednesday, where are we? We've got Agent Eddie Joe Zambrana. Yeah, there we go. I'm <laughs> completely off on the date here, but there you go. Yes. Yeah. I'm so looking forward to both of those. They're both super fun. Eddie Joe is so pumped about the show, and we are so pumped to have him on. It's going to be a great week. Really looking forward to it. Absolutely. All right. Anything else for the rest of the week? Um, no, I'm not sure what's going on Thursday night yet. So I don't have anything for that. I know, uh, tomorrow, uh, Terry and Rich will be back with their daily show at noon Eastern. Not sure which track, but they always have their full card picks. Yes. Hot dog pick four, prime rib pick fours, um, <laughs> picks with the professor, check him out. Picks yes. with the professor.com and at professor side on Twitter, always giving out picks and usually usually winning. So if you do the sports betting, check him out. There you go. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and thank you for all the love that you give us. We need it. We want it. Give us some more. Give us the likes, the shares, the follows. Thank you. <laughs> and um, we hope that we see you on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, but no matter where else we see you, we want to see you in the Winner circle. Winner circle. That's right.